I am not seeing my neurosurgeons at all. I, I kind of think that most of my doctors had good intentions and really did want to help me. But I think in a lot of cases, they do more harm than good. What happened with me? And so I, I just don't feel very comfortable seeing doctors anymore. I don't feel comfortable being in that setting or being in hospital as they weren't able to help me when I was at my worst. I do want to write them letters just telling them of what has helped me and how I'm doing now, because I think, you know, some of them might be interested and be open-minded about some of the things I'm doing, so. Okay, good morning, everybody. Happy uh, Thursday morning. We've got Rachel with us. Rachel, good morning. Yes. Perfect. Well, good to see you. Where are you located, Rachel? I am in North Carolina, so I live in this beautiful forest here yeah. on about six or seven acres, and we actually just had somebody harvest a deer in our on our land last night. So. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Nice. Yeah. North Carolina. I remember when I, I visited North Carolina, hadn't been in a while and I was coming from New Mexico and I was surprised. Wow. There's actually trees here. It's pretty neat to see. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty. <laughs> they do a lot of furniture. They used to do a lot of furniture manufacturing in North Carolina. It used to be like, I don't know if it's still like yep. high point, North Carolina is a big furniture manufacturing place. Well, well, welcome. Thank you for taking the time to doing this. And I understand you've got a kind of an interesting um, background story. And so, I'll let, I'll let you just get started. Tell us a little bit about yourself, you, you know, you're growing yeah. up and what's going on and how, how things have gone for you. Yeah, thanks for having me. So I'm 27 years old and over the last six years or so, I have for the most part of that time been very sick. And prior to that, I was pretty healthy. I had a couple of health problems growing up. I had celiac disease, um, but once I went gluten-free, then everything seemed to go well. And when I was in college, my last year of college, I started getting all sorts of unusual neurological symptoms. And those just progressed as the years went on. And I was diagnosed with uh, hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, dysautonomia or POTS, um, celiac disease, intranal hypertension, hearing malformation, um, Hellard cord syndrome, cervical instability. Uh, I'm probably missing a few, but the list kind of goes on there as well as chronic Lyme disease. And so over those years, I saw dozens of doctors and specialists. I went to the Mayo Clinic. I saw top neurosurgeons. I saw top doctors for uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And while I'm thankful that I was able to see those doctors, they ultimately didn't really help me. And I actually had five uh, brain and neurosurgeries during that time. I had a craniocervical fusion, C0 to C2. Hmm. I had a Chiari decompression surgery. I had a tethered cord release surgery. And I had two uh, venous scents placed in my in my brain, in the transverse, right transverse sinus and the superior sagittal sinus to try to lower the intracranial pressure in my brain. And while some of those treatments did provide some temporary relief in some cases, as time went on, I just continued to get worse. And a couple of years ago, I sort of decided to go a different route with how was I was approaching my health and looking for answers and looking for a better quality of life. And I decided to go a more natural route and be more open-minded and have come across a lot of things that have really helped me, including the carnivore diet. So, well, that's a lot of, a lot of stuff for 26 years. I mean, gosh, you know, all those crane, all those, uh, you know, neurosurgeries, you know, the craniotomies and things like that. And, you know, you got to you know, fusing to see your occiput to C2 is, is, you know, pretty, you know, kind of interesting to say the least. What were the symptoms you were having to all these things? Because I mean, when you have all, when they're doing all these extensive surgeries, it had to be for something. It was it was impacting your life in what way? What what couldn't you do, or what kind of struggles were you having? It impacted my life in in every way. Um, it was com I was completely debilitated with symptoms and have a whole long laundry list of symptoms. But some of the main ones were severe 
migraines and headaches, severe neck pain, pressure behind my eyes. I had weakness in my legs. I was having non-epileptic seizure episodes, tingling and numbness in my lower extrem- extremities, and really loud ringing in my ears. I was super, super sensitive to lights and sound. And at my worst point of illness, I often would have to just lay in a dark, quiet room. It affected my walking. I Uh, Unless it was just around the house, then I had to use a wheelchair. A lot of the time, I actually needed help walking around the house, depending on what kind of day I was having. I was essentially bed bound, spent, yeah, the better part of several years just in bed. Yeah, that's a that's a tough quality of life. Uh, were they were you prescribed a lot of medications? Were pain medications and migraine medications and seizure meds and all that stuff? Were you on a bunch of meds? Yeah. So I I tried a lot of medications. I've always been really sensitive to medications. And a lot of times the side effects for me would would be pretty strong and it wouldn't help very much. And so I tried a lot of medications, but I didn't stay on too many. I also had adrenal insufficiency. So I was on a daily dose of steroids. And that was a really interesting journey as well. But I am completely off of all medications now and doing well. So I mean, well, that's wonderful to hear. I mean, gosh, you know, and, and you know, you think about there's other people that, you know, in similar circumstances, and everybody's a little unique, but there's other people that, you know, have debilitation. And so what, you know, at what point did you say, hey, I'm just this medical route, these drugs, these surgeries is, is just not getting me where I want to go. What, what, what was the straw that broke the camel's back where you just said, Hey, I'm going to take matters into my own hands. Thank you guys for whatever you did for me, but it didn't really help that much. What, what, what was it? What was the decision point? I would say about three years into my journey after I'd had my last neurosurgery, I was being suggested to have more surgery and to have a a shunt placed in Mm -hmm. my brain. And I just, it just didn't feel right. And I was so sick. This was about a year after my Chiari and cervical fusion. I was just in the worst state that I had been in. And I just thought, you know, hey, these surgeries were all supposed to help me so much. They really didn't. And so I just thought there has to be something else. Like this route is not getting me anywhere. And so I really started to look in other directions for healing. And something interesting too, is that during several of my neurosurgeries, my surgeon said that I was one of the worst cases that he'd ever seen with brainstem damage. And also with my tethered cord surgery, he said that the, my spinal cord, the phylum was the worst tether he'd ever seen. And that it was, I guess the phylum was 15 times the size of a normal spinal cord. So he was really intrigued by that, but he said, you'll be feeling so much better after the surgery. And so I was really hopeful about it, but I never saw those improvements. I I started with acupuncture that provided, just kind of took the edge off of things for me. And I still enjoy getting acupuncture. Then I started to read about nutrition. I tried, actually tried vegetarian for about a month and that did not go so well. And I was doing meditation. I was doing all sorts of different, I guess you could say natural things, but I still, I still didn't see a lot of progress. And then finally I stumbled upon some people saying that they had had amazing results with the carnivore diet. And so I did research for about a month, extensive research just from my bed. (laughs) And I decided that I was going to give it a try. And um, it was it was tough, but I now over a year later am doing so much better. I, I do want to be clear that that is not the carnivore diet is not the only thing that I'm doing to heal. I'm, I've also been having prolotherapy injections below my fusion in my neck, and that has I was in a neck brace. That's another thing that I didn't mention. I was in a neck brace pretty much twenty four seven. I was just reliant on it, and I just could not hold my head up without it. And so I I got these prolotherapy injections and that has helped a lot. And something that's cool about those treatments that I've been having is they actually measure your vagus nerve with an ultrasound. And my vagus nerve has actually doubled in size since earlier this year. The pressures in my brain are starting to come down as well. So, and then 
just as I've been continuing the carnivore diets, I've seen a lot of healing as well. So Yeah, I mean, just just to back up. So the Chiari malformation, for people that aren't familiar with it, basically part of your brainstem, your cerebellum is actually kind of poking out of your skull into your spinal cord where it's not supposed to be. And they have to go in and I guess, you know, I'm not sure what the surgery, how they do the surgery, but that's, that's one of the things you're dealing with. And so you've got all these issues and if I correct me if I'm wrong, but on, on your social media, you go by rib, ribeye rate or something like that. Is that, that's, that's kind of your, yeah, your that's so you're, I'm assuming you're eating a lot of ribeye steaks. So tell us about, you know, your, what are you eating? What does the carnivore diet look like for you? In the beginning, I did eat quite a bit of steak, but Actually, I was looking to gain weight, so I've actually gained 30 pounds, which is a good thing. Anyways, as for my diet, I would say I actually don't eat a lot of steak now. I eat a lot of of cuts that have or a lot of connected tissue like chuck roast. And at this point, I eat a lot of raw butter to sort of up the the fat intake. I, I do feel better with a higher fat content, but I, I eat, I guess what they would say, nose to tail. I do eat organs. I make bone broth. I pretty much keep a pretty good variety with the carnivore diet. For about seven months in the middle of my carnivore journey, I did the strict lion diet. So I was pretty much doing the salt and water and that's it. Really strict about it. But I actually found that I do, I do better not on the lion diet. And when I added in um, some raw dairy and added in some corn and soy free pork and chicken and a little bit of salmon here and there, I found that actually helped me. Good for you. Good for you for being willing to experiment and see what happens to you. When you, you said you put on, how, how light did you get? How how little were you when you, you remember your bottom weight was? Just, just around a hundred pounds, maybe slightly below. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that was the lowest point. And I, so I was pretty tiny. I, I came really close to needing a feeding tube several times. That That's another whole part of my journey that I didn't mention in the beginning with symptoms, but I had a lot of serious GI symptoms, gastroparesis, just difficulty eating in general. It was, it was tricky for me in the beginning with carnivore. The goal was really just like trying to get myself to eat as much as I could. And at first I hated every bite of the meat that I had. Then of course, eventually I got accustomed to it and was able to to tolerate it and digest it better. But in the beginning it was, it was rough, so, but I just decided to stick to it. And I'm glad I did. So, I mean, you said in the beginning, you didn't like it. I mean, did you grow up not eating much meat? Was it, what was your diet like as a kid? What And, and how did, you know, I mean, Obviously, the the tethered cord, the the, the Chiari malformation were probably, you know, you had those the whole time through birth. I don't think that impacted your developing that, I don't think. But some of these other things probably were migraine, seizures, gastroparesis, all those things could have been related to diet, I suspect. So what were you eating as a kid? You didn't eat much meat as a kid or how did that work? Yeah, I, I didn't eat much meat as a as a kid. I'm pretty standard American diet. I ate a lot of pizza, chicken nuggets. I wanted to be vegetarian, but bless my mom's heart, she she did not allow that. And looking back, I really don't think that I ate much red meat at all. My mom would try to get me to eat it, but I just wouldn't do it. I was a really picky child. And so when <laughs> my family and friends heard of what I was doing at the carnivore diet, they were kind of in shock that I was eating these things. But yeah, pretty, pretty standard American. And then when I went off to college, I, you know, I, I don't even remember cooking meat at all. When you said you wanted to be a vegetarian as a kid, why? What, what, what was compelling you to do that? Was it, was it a compassion for thinking you're saving animals or what was it, What was the reason for that? It was a, a mix of loving animals as well as just not liking eating meats. I think my palate was just tainted by processed foods and I, I just wasn't a big fan of eating meat. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because a lot of, you know, plant-based people, vegans will say the only reason you eat meat is because you're selfish and you only care about what your, your, your taste buds. And I'm like, if I only ate for taste buds, I'd be eating chocolate cake all day. I mean, you know, I mean, I think I still think chocolate cake, cake, chocolate cake yeah. tastes better to me than meat to me. But I mean, meat tastes pretty damn good. But, and it's kind of funny because, you know, you, the first thing you said is somebody got a deer here, somebody harvested a deer on your property, which, you know, is definitely a change in, I guess, beliefs or thoughts or, or, or understanding the value of why we maybe eat these animals is because they nourish us in such a way. And that's what we're, I would argue, designed to do. Let's talk about a little bit the family. So when you say, hey, I'm going to go to this carnivore diet, do they think, oh, she's just doing another crazy thing. She was vegetarian. How, how did they respond to that? And then I guess, 
I mean, clearly, I assume, you know, if you were bed bound for two years, somebody had to notice something's gotten better, right? I mean, someone noticed this. What did they say? Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. So my family was thankfully really supportive of it. And I think they kind of trusted that I had done research on it. My dad, actually, at the time, my husband and I were living with my parents while we, while we were looking for a house. And my dad kind of did it with me, which was nice to have somebody to do it with. And in the beginning, I wasn't well enough to cook my own meals. So my family had to help me out. There wasn't really much of an issue there. And I I was so sick that I wasn't really going out to socialize and seeing much of other people. And so really, when my friends saw the difference in me, they were excited about it and interested. And, you know, some people probably thought I was crazy and that's that's okay. Overall, people just saw a really big difference in me. And like when I have extended family members come into town to visit, they just a lot of times can't believe the difference in just how I look and how I'm doing and how I'm able to sit up and be around people and enjoy time with my family. So... Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I, I guess I've seen, like, I've seen your social media, and I know I do this, like, pictures of you with a walker and, you know, wearing a neck brace and, you know, I mean, obviously struggling to just do the basic things of life. How much, how much have you gained, you know, and what do you still have to do? Where, where are you still, where do you still need to get to? Yeah, that's a good question. So I would say I've gained about maybe 25 to 30 percent functionality of where I was at before I got sick, but compared to where I was at my worst. I kind of like to compare it to, you know, like a, a battery percentage of a phone, like what my functionality was. I was pretty much at like a 1%. At 25%, that's huge. So my life just looks completely different. I barely have to spend any time in bed. I'm able to cook all my own meals. I'm able to help clean the house. I'm able to go on walks. I walked my first mile earlier this year. I think in April, I walked my first mile. So I go on a walk every day and... I'm just now, I just started to do some more strength exercises. So I, I joined the local gym last week and I'm starting to start with some weights. And actually prior to becoming sick, I was a competitive rock climber. I was a rock climbing coach. And so I was very physically strong. So I'm really looking forward to getting that back and hopefully getting back to rock climbing in the next months. So Wow, that's 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 pretty amazing. That sure that sure is. Yeah, some major issues. Any other sort of quality of life things? I mean, some people talk about skin and hair and digestion and you know mental health. Any of those things been impacted by this? I would say my skin is has always been pretty good. I, that didn't affect me too much with my illness, and my hair has always been really thick. But I've noticed that it has gotten thicker and it is growing faster which I don't necessarily want, but it is a good thing, I guess. As for sunburns, I, I, I don't really get sunburned, even though I'm super pale. I'm guessing that's probably the seed oils being taken out. As for mental health, I actually, I didn't struggle with too severe of mental health issues. Thankfully, during my chronic illness journey, I wasn't really depressed. I did have little bits of anxiety here and there, just from medical trauma and whatnot. But I, that has improved some, so. How about the, the gastroparesis? And for those who don't know, explain to people what gastroparesis is for people that don't know that term. Yeah, so it's just basically your stomach and your intestines don't digest food at the at the proper rate. Would you say that's a good way to explain yeah, it's it? Of, it's almost like a, para, a paralysis of yeah. the stomach. It just kind of sits there and it doesn't churn as well and it's slow and you, food just sits in your stomach a lot longer than it's supposed to. And yeah. So how does that, how's that help? How's that doing for you? Is that, is that improved? It's definitely improved, but I would say I'm still not all the way there yet. I still struggle to digest fats sometimes and still have some digestive symptoms, but I'm able to eat so much more, which is awesome because I, I was just really like, even just taking a few bites of food at my worst was just like so hard to do, even though I, I wanted to eat, I wanted to gain weight and have an eating disorder. I'm really thankful that I'm able to eat a lot more. Something that has also helped me a lot is I, I've done this brain retraining program. Basically you're doing a lot of visualizations of yourself being healthy, doing things that you want to be doing. And, and that's kind of, I think, helps get my body out of that chronic fight or flight state and allow me to 
get to a place where I can start to heal and start to digest my foods better. That that's been another really important part of my healing as well. In addition to the diet. Hey folks, it's Dr. Sean Baker here. If you guys are enjoying these success stories, well, you can become your own success story. You can do that by heading over to carnivore.diet. You can sign up for a free 30 day trial and get started today. We're looking forward to supporting you. Our community is wonderful and we'd love to see your success. Yeah, well, one of the one of the, the the nice features of our skull is it protects our brain. It's a thick case, you know. The the negative of that is it doesn't move. There's no flexibility in there. So when there's pressure that that increases in, in our skull, it can be very it can rapidly lead to big problems. And so you talked about they were talking about doing a, a venous shunt or perhaps I don't know, maybe a venous per perineal shunt, I suspect, but I'm not sure what they're gonna do. But when you when your intracranial pressure was going up, could you sense that or how do you know it's can you tell it's better now? Are you getting migraines or pain or symptoms and, and how does that work today? Yeah, thankfully my my pain and migraines and symptoms in, re in relation to the high pressure has decreased a lot. I before could could just tell it felt like my eyes were popping out of my head. It felt like my head was just going to blow up. Like it hurt so bad all the time. I just, it was like, I couldn't see straight. I guess not, not much better way to explain it other than it felt like my head was going to explode. But yeah, thankfully now I, I have times where I don't have any head pain at all. And I also have times where I don't have any neck pain at all, which my doctors and my surgeon told me that I would be in pain forever. Likely not that they wanted me to be in pain, but they said, you know, realistically, that was what was going to happen. And I'm just, just grateful that that, that doesn't have to be the case. Yeah, that is wonderful. I, let me, let me ask you, on that point, do you still see your neurosurgeon? Are you still in contact with the doctors? Do they know that you're on a new diet? Are they commenting on any of this stuff? I am not seeing my neurosurgeons at all. I'm seeing the the prolotherapy doctor mm -hmm. that I saw in Florida to get the injections in my neck, that regenerative medicine. So he's really the only doctor that I've been seeing over the last couple of years. I, I kind of think that that most of my doctors had good intentions and really did want to help me. But I think in a lot of cases, they do more harm than good. You know, what what happened with me? And so I, I just don't feel very comfortable seeing doctors anymore. I don't feel comfortable being in that setting or being in a hospital or whatever, because they weren't able to help me when I was at my worst. I do want to write them letters just telling them of what has helped me and how I'm doing now, because I think, you know, some of them might be interested and be, be open-minded about some of the things I'm doing. So. Yeah. And let me just, just to, oh, cause you've mentioned two of them, certainly, you know, diet, carnivore diet, which is, you know, kind of why you're here, I guess, but, and, and, you know, the prolotherapy, what in brain retraining. So these, what are the combination of things you've done to sort of overcome or get you where you are to make this improvement? Do you mean how much success do I attribute to each thing? Well, yeah, or? sure. You can certainly you can certainly answer it that way. What are your thoughts? Okay, yeah. So I I think the the biggest things for me have been diets and then brain retraining and prolotherapy would probably be would come in third. And um, honestly, I would say the brain retraining was just as impactful as the diets, and I think. Some of that stems from being told by doctors for so long that you're not going to heal. When you, if you don't believe you're going to heal, then you're not going to, no matter what you're eating, then, you know, it's, it's just not going to be possible. And when you, you're told for so long you have these incurable diseases, then that kind of, you have to like retrain your brain to realize, no, like I can heal. And, that was a really big turning point for me in my healing journey when I realized that I could get better. And I always, I was always positive. I was always hopeful that I would have a better quality of life than I did then. But I thought, oh, you know, like I'm, this is going to be something I'm going to have to deal with for the rest of my life. But when I just sort of let go of those limiting beliefs and started to like let myself fully believe that I could heal, that was a turning point for me. Yeah, I think the point you're making about actually having a belief 
and that, that's shown about any any intervention. If you don't believe it's going to happen, then most likely you're going to you're going to reduce the likelihood of being successful. So you have to have some sort of conception that you can heal to to be able to do that. So good for you for uh, for doing that. Have you ever been tempted to to say, hey, I'm going to try to add you know whatever fruit or you know that's just pretty popular now. People adding fruit. Thing. Have you added things to the diet? And if so, have they been problematic for you or have you played with that at all? You know, I was really, really strict for the first, most of the year. I, I didn't deviate at all or try anything else at all, just because I wanted to to just give my body the best chance that I could to let it heal. And I didn't want to set myself back by, by trying other things. But in the last couple of months, I've been a bit more okay with having a bite of something else here and there just to see. At first, I did react pretty negative to, negatively to trying other things. But now I think the brain retraining has helped with that as well. Because I think sometimes people, they, they all they hear is, is carnivore diet related stuff. And so they almost get it in their head that if they, they eat anything else, that they're just going to have a reaction to it. And because they think that they do. With the brain retraining, I've been able to, to introduce some other foods without any reaction. But I, I really just, I like the simplicity of carnivore. And so I, I, typically do a hundred percent, but you know, I'll have a strawberry or I'll have a, a small bite of something that's like a whole food. I'm not, not going to have anything with seed oils. I'm not going to have anything with sugar. Those are pretty non-negotiable for me, but I also tried a little bit of honey. That was another thing that I tried. Uh, I, sometimes I can tell I have a little bit of a reaction, but, but, but not too severe anymore. Yeah. So you keep it in, in very small, small amounts and avoid the, 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 the garbage that most of us eat, you know, like you would have been eating in college and all that stuff for sure. As far as your goals at this point, are you, you know, you said you want to get back to rock climbing. Uh, I assume, I mean, I don't know if, if family or having, having a family or having kids or having a career, what, what are your, what are your aspirations at this point? And are you continuing to see progress on a weekly basis? Are you continuing to get better each week? I don't know about on a weekly basis, things are, are up and down, but I'm continuing to, to go upwards and be on an upward trajectory with my healing. And so I, I expect to make a full recovery. I, I expect to be a hundred percent healthy and active and being able to do hopefully all the things that I used to do. And uh, as for goals, I, I do want to be a mother one day. I do want to have kids. And I look forward to that because for so long, I didn't think that would be a possibility. And then as for like athletic goals, I, I'm hoping to be able to, to climb again. And actually the, my next stuff is the, is kind of what's still holding me back from being able to climb again, but it's gotten so much better. So I am thinking that I'll be able to climb again and be able to enjoy that. I really enjoy, you know, skiing, hiking, all those things and traveling. So yeah, I just hope to be able to do everything. Yeah, just get back to kind of a normal life for sure. And, you know, it sounds like you're you're well on your way. I know you're on social media, so you have people probably commenting either good, bad, probably, I would assume mostly it's positive, I have to imagine. Anybody you've been able to impact to say, to influence their diet or anything like that? Or have you tried to do that? Or is that really what you, you try to mess with that at all? Yeah, I, I've had a lot of messages of people telling me that they have seen amazing improvements. And, and what's really cool about it is that, you know, I think in the carnivore community, it's pretty rare to see someone with the conditions that I have sharing their story. And that's one of the reasons why I want to share my story, because I know how difficult it is to be that sick. And I know there's still a lot of people that are as sick as I was or worse. I just hope that through sharing, I can impact people and just give them the hope that they are going to be able to heal and have a better quality of life. Even if you don't get to hundred percent, you know, 90% better is just, is amazing and incredible. And I've, I've gotten messages from probably dozens of people with EDS that said they've gone either animal based or carnivore and have seen just completely life changing results. And that to me is just amazing. I hope more people will start to share their story that have EDS or Chiari and dysautonomia or POTS. I hope that that more people will will share their story because I think that that that's a community that really needs hope. Unfortunately, it seems like people are not 
seeing healing and progress by going to all these top specialists for the conditions that I have. Yeah, I so. forgot I forgot you mentioned the Ehlers Danlos syndrome or the EDS. I mean, that, and that's something that really shocked me the first time I saw someone improve significantly by going on a carnivore diet. I was really, and I remember I, I remember the interview I did. It was with a a, a, a physician, an ER physician in I want to say um, the Netherlands or perhaps I think Denmark actually. And she was, you know, a physician said, I've got EDS. I wake up every day with dislocated joints. And she went carnivore within a month, no more dislocations. And, and it, she's maintained that for several years now, which I think is quite, quite amazing that something like a genetic connective tissue disorder responds to a dietary change, which to me really just was something that really blew my mind away. And I, I didn't, we didn't even touch on, on your aspect of that. And so yeah. hypermobility, were you having subluxations and things like that prior to? Yeah, yeah. I had very frequently had subluxations, joint pain. My jaw was dislocated, actually still kind of is, but I had several procedures under anesthesia on my jaw. They wanted to do jaw surgery. Thankfully, I never did that. But overall, my joint pain has decreased so much. It's mostly gone. And um, I, I don't see those subluxations or dislocations really at all anymore. And so I, I think, you know, along with the prolotherapy in my neck, my neck was my worst instability. I was completely like partially dislocating my neck just from moving. And I think the diet probably was a big part along with the prolotherapy to help stabilize my neck again. So I don't have to to wear the neck brace anymore. And yeah, it's just really cool because I think a lot of people that have EDS are told by doctors that they won't get any, any better. They're going to be sick for the rest of their lives. They're just going to have to try to manage. I just personally think that can't be further from the truth. I think that there's always, always room for healing and improvement. Yeah, that, that, that is. I mean, can you think about, you know, a lot of potential surgeries a person with Ehlers-Danlos would have, you know, stability surgeries, fuse joint fusions and things like that as things go down the road and you can maybe avoid those uh, type of things. With regard to your neck, I mean, it's got to be great not having to wear a dang brace all the time. I know how, how annoying and uncomfortable those things can be. You know, I, you know, I don't know if you had a soft, it looks like you had a soft collar, but some of these really rigid ones like Miami J's and stuff are just like, ah, they're like pain to wear. But I'm sure right yeah. after you had the fusion, you had to wear this I would assume maybe a big brace, I'm, I'm guessing. But um, are you doing any next specific strengthening exercises? Is that, is that part of the rehab or did, was it just diet that made your neck stronger? What are, your, what, are you, what are you doing with that? Yeah, so I'm also, they have me doing neck weights to, to correct the neck curve and they've been looking at the x-ray and I just like where this is, is a strap that goes around my neck and the weight hangs down behind my back. And I just do that every day for a few minutes. And they've, it's cool. They've been able to show me on the x-ray how my neck is, is now looking like it's in the right normal position and it's not, you know, partially dislocating anymore. Also on the x-ray with the, the prolotherapist, my instability went from severe to mild. It's almost gone now. So. Wow. That's, that's amazing. That sure is. So, um, what is your, um, I guess, do you have a favorite food? You said you, you said you prefer, you know, more like chuck roast and things like that. Do you have a favorite you're, you're currently eating? I would say brisket is one of my top favorites along with ribeye. Ribeye is kind of like a, a special treat for me, but I, I know I I'm ribeye rich. I should be eating it every day like you are, but <laughs> It's, I, it's more of a treat. For I, me, I don't so. eat I don't eat ribeye every day, but I do eat a lot of ribeyes. I have eaten a lot of. Them. In fact, I'm having I've got one I'm got one cooking right now in the sous vide. So I, I have got that. I've got I got a ribeye and a couple fillets. I'm going to eat today and a bunch of eggs. And so so you have a husband. Does what does he eat? is he eating more a lot of meat now or is he? I'm sure he's like, hey, cool, meat's good. Most guys most guys are in, most guys are pretty down with you know eating a bunch of meat. But I mean, how's your husband do? Yeah, he's good. So he is not carnivore. He's he has eaten a lot more meat and he's done sort of like low carb and and feels better that way, but he's never never gone strict. And I think he what he's lately he's really been into completely trying to cut off eating seed oils and even just seeing benefits with that. He doesn't really have any health problems, but um I know when he was doing lower carb, he he felt like he had more energy. And so, you know, you never know, but he, he definitely does 
after I started eating carnivore definitely does eat more meat. So he, he did go vegeta- vegetarian with me when I did the vegetarian, but he didn't, he hasn't done the full carnivore yet. So interesting. I wonder how, how much he liked the vegetarian. Looks like he didn't stick with it. So he must not like, no, it no, much. no, neither of us did. <laughs> <laughs> it was only a, a month or two. Yeah, the interesting, so. you know, the interesting thing about seed oils because I know there's a lot of people. It's 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 a sugar, it's a seed oils, it's this and that. And I and I, I always, you know, I still say I don't know for sure because I I just think it's hard to know for sure. I, I do I know though when you cut out seed oils, you're mostly just cutting out a lot of processed food because that's where you mostly find seed oils. It's not like people are out there drinking bottles of Wesson oil. I mean, some people fry in it, but I mean, mostly we're just it just generally means we're cutting out ultra processed food when we cut out those seed oils. So it could be the combination of the whole thing. There, it's kind of an an interesting uh, thing. So you're out in in North Carolina, and I know you're you're posting on social media fairly frequently. Where where do people go to? Well, let me before I move. Is there anything else you want to share? Because I want to make sure you got to say everything you wanted to say. I don't think so. I mean, I think I just want to encourage people that are in a difficult spot right now that you know healing is possible. Our bodies have an amazing ability to heal, even from the worst of places. So. Just, just don't give up hope and and keep, yeah, keep believing that you can heal. Well, I have to, I have to commend you. You've just got this wonderful positive attitude. I mean, for somebody who's been through all this, there's a lot of people I could see would be rightly, you know, kind of not so happy, but you seem happy and pleasant. And I guess maybe feeling better is, is doing that. And and, can, and thank you for sharing this. This is going to undoubtedly uh, make some people smile and hopefully inspire some people. And you've got so many EDS migraines you know, epilepsy, Chiari malformations, tethered cord, gastroparesis, you know, all these things that you, you're, you're improving with, with diet and a few other things. So good for you. Good on you. Okay. So where do people go to find you if they want to look for you and want to hear more about what's going on with you? Yeah. So just ribeye Rach on Instagram and also ribeye Rach on YouTube. Okay. And there's no space. It's just, it, there's, there, there's no space in there. It's just ribeye and then R-A-C-H, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much, Rachel. Appreciate it. You have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful life. I'd love to see how you're doing a year from now and see if you go from 25% to 75% or however long it takes. And good for you and good luck on the climbing and all those great things. So thanks. The rest of you guys, thank you so much. We'll be back tomorrow. You guys have a great day. Um, Bye-bye, everybody. Take care now.